Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brattleboro Democracy Forum meeting on Tuesday, July 6, 2021. The subject of today's meeting is, is there democracy in America? Before we get started, it's great to see you all here. Before we get started, I have uh, a few announcements to make. The first one is that the meeting is being recorded and it will air on BCTV and WVEW. We want to have a quality soundtrack, so please mute yourself if there's a lot of noise going on in your house. And <clears throat> the first time you speak, please identify yourself and where you're from. Uh, the second time you speak and the following times, just identify yourself by saying, this is Marietta, for example. So we're talking about, is there democracy in America? I've been wondering about that myself. So I'm looking forward to what Nick <laughs> say. Nick has lived in Brattleboro since 2013. He is a retired professor of Latin American history. And Tim Kipp is a retired history and political science teacher of 39 years and a political activist since the 1960s. So welcome, Tim and Nick. And Nick, I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. I think uh, Tim's going to go first. Is that oh, right? really? OK. Thanks, Woody. Um, I'm my uh, observations, remarks, and so forth tonight are, in some ways, to be provocative. But in many ways, I'm thinking that it is uh, it is time to start talking about this kind of reality. And I'll, I will give you my thesis in in a um, um, few words here. The U.S. was never founded on a, on democratic principles. If you look at uh, Plymouth and Jamestown, we're built on religious intolerance imperialism, genocide, and systemic racism, i.e. slavery. How could it be a democracy when people were either driven from the land, slaughtered, or enslaved as animals? The native population in North America went from approximately 10 to 20 million in 1500 to a quarter of a million in 1900. Africans were captured and made slaves for nearly 250 years. That, that reaching a peak of 4 million in bondage by the time of the Civil War. This country still confronts the consequences of this legacy of oppression. During the horrendous regime of Trump, political analysts, mainstream media, conventional historians, politicians conjured the decline of, the erosion of, the assault on, the undermining of, the twilight of, these are all quotes I picked up in the media, or the pending ending days of our democracy. My presentation posits that we are not a democracy. While there have been magnificent and significant episodes of true democratic struggles, they have only come about because of the reaction to the absence of democracy. It is the victims themselves have, who have created those opportunities and those expressions of democracy. Real democracy, in my view, in the United States is found in the civil rights movement, in the women's movement, the labor movement, the peace movement, environmental movement, the gender rights movement, and so forth. The founders of this country created a rhetorical and historic trap for themselves and for us. We are a nation founded on an idea, the magnificent idea of democracy. And when at those times, when people try to cash that promissory note, demanding the country live up to its articulated ideals and ideas, the people are most often met with government intransigence, opposition and or class and or white backlash. The Trump administration, in my view, is not an aberration, it is a logical consequence of an undemocratic system. Thus, I will explore this, this undemocratic nature uh, from both his uh, structural and historical point of view. And, I, by, and I'm gonna do it by um, examining aspects of the constitution, federalism, the representative system, the party system, and the Supreme Court. And, uh, 
So my my the thrust of my thesis is that it's more systemic than bad leadership. It's not just the malevolence and incompetence, although we certainly have a lot of that in our leadership, but it has to do with the system itself needs restoration, transformation. So that's my, that is uh, basically my thesis. I'll, let's start with the constitution. Constitution was written as a document to protect property rights. It was written by the few for the few. The 55 delegates at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 uh, were not a representation of our general population. There weren't women, there weren't blacks, there weren't natives, there weren't poor, there weren't working class people at the table. Not only were they not at the table, when it came time to, to ratify uh, the, uh, the Constitution and state conventions, those people were excluded as well. So it became a repl replication of a, an elite representation. And if any of this surprises you, just listen to some of the ideas of our founders at the time. Madison, James Madison, as we all know, the, 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 the founder, the father of the Constitution said this, that we need the Constitution to secure the public good and private rights against the dangers of factions, i.e. the classes and at the same time preserve the spirit and the form of popular uh, uh, government. He said, the Constitution needs to be in order to check the leveling, quote, and this is his quote, leveling impulses, unquote, of the property-less multitudes who comprise, quote, the majority faction. Probably the most transparent of all, and I could quote many other founders, John Jay from New York said, Quote, the people who own the country ought to run the country. Years later, John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams, when he was, when John Quincy was president in the, um, he said, the effect of the constitution was to quote, increase the influence and power of wealth of those who have it already, unquote. According to uh, political scientist, Michael Perini, he says that the Constitution was designed to, quote, win popular support, but not to tamper with the existing power structure, it was to create a government strong enough to service the growing needs of the entrepreneurial and landed classes while withstanding the egalitarian demands of ordinary people. So what is it about the, the, the Constitution, as, as I see it, that are structurally undemocratic? Okay, I'm going to go through a number of, of um, aspects of that. As a reaction to the Articles of Confederation, which helped spawn um, the, the people's uprising, such as Shays' Rebellion in the, eighth, in the 1780s, uh, the founders felt that they needed to have a, a, a more formalized, centralized structure in order to maintain um, some semblance of control um, in, in, within the society. So what the constitution does is it puts property rights before human rights. It centralizes and consolidates the power for the financial elites. And a, a classic example of this, there's two of them. One is number one, who could vote? And we all know this, all right, only white male property owners up until the 1830s had the right to vote. It excluded everyone else, all right? Also, if you look at the, de the, the uh, convention debates, the, the one area where there was the, the greatest amount of consensus was over the Commerce Clause. Commerce Clause is Article 1, Section 8, outlines what are the property rights, regulation of commerce, taxation, tariffs, all concerns of investor class and the creditors. And of that, there was a near universal consensus that the constitution must uphold and protect the commerce of this society, which is in itself isn't all that unreasonable until it is it, until it is in fact translated into political power. The commerce clause um, was a, um, um, aided uh, by articles three and four of the constitution. And if you look at the bill of rights, half if not more of the bill of rights, the articles uh, are directly related to property rights. So articles three, four, 
five, seven, and eight of the Bill of Rights. And I would argue that the Second Amendment also could fit into that. In 1888, that radical, that old radical um, uh, president, Grover Cleveland, opined about the nature and the impact of the Constitution. Quote, classes are rapidly forming, one comprising the very rich and powerful, while in another are found the toiling poor. He, say, he goes on, he says, corporations are fast becoming the people's masters. So what the Constitution also does is preserve, in my view, a, a very stratified class structure. It did then, it does now. So there was a continued exploitation of slaves, women, Native Americans, working class, and the poor, or as I call them, the usual suspects. So you look at the, uh, how the Constitution protected slavery, the Three-Fifths Compromise, uh, the pseudo ban on, on importation of slaves, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act, the first one in 1796, I believe it is. All of these will serve to keep slavery in place um, until uh, the Civil War. Another aspect of this undemocratic nature of the Constitution is that what the Constitution does is it establishes long-term socialization of inferiority. Yes, we know that women got the right to vote. Blacks have gotten the right to vote, although that's, that's being challenged for sure now. Native Americans eventually got the right to vote and so forth. But for the history of this country, those usual suspects were the victims of uh, the messages of inferiority. For 246 years, there's been legal or de jure slavery. Or if you put it in more human terms, 12 generations of African Americans have lived under the, under the cloud and the chain and the hammer of slavery. And then after Reconstruction and when Reconstruction uh, ends and gets destroyed by the Supreme Court, and conservative political forces, the Jim Crow system will replace it. A system of neo-slavery, in my view, that we still have in its remnants till this day. And lastly, in terms of structural defects that make the, our constitution undemocratic is the idea that our constitution <laughs> does not guarantee some fundamental rights, not explicitly, and yet it has to be fought for in indirect ways through the use of the 14th Amendment. This, this Constitution said nothing about health care, nothing about shelter, nothing about food, nothing about employment being guaranteed, nothing about guaranteed education, and of course, nothing about a Social Security retirement system. In 1944, Franklin Roosevelt proposed an economic bill of rights that would delineate those, that those rights that I just mentioned be put in the Constitution. That proposal went nowhere. Thus, we find in conclusion of this section, the prevailing doctrinal systems prevents a consideration of viable alternative systems. So how is that democratic? Now, let me go on to federalism, one of the, one of the uh, key aspects of the structure of our, uh, and principle of our constitution. I maintain that federalism, as, it, as we have seen it historically, has been another unconstitutional formation within our system. These are the powers that aren't delegated to the United States by the Constitution are, are given a reserve to the states. So federalism, the shared power of the, of the federal government in the, in the 50 states. In reality, what has happened is that, that over, over time, and this really happened starting in the early 19th century, that federalism created some of the most viciously contested areas of constitutional terrain. Congress, abetted by historically conservative Supreme Court, has used that cry, and we certainly heard this, we heard it in the civil rights movement, we heard it in, uh, uh, during the Civil War, the idea of states' rights. You can't tell me what to do. The federal government can't come in and tell what we can do in Georgia or Vermont or wherever. So states' rights becomes 
the rallying cry for I regard as very conservative reactionary forces in this country. Reactionary forces, i.e. undemocratic forces. So what, is that, what, what does that leave us with? It gives us a constitution that supports a defense of slavery. Look from Dred Scott um, is, or, or is one of the, the key, the key uh, issues that we have, we have always allude to in 1857. This, the, the Constitution has denied, has been used in the form of states' rights to deny civil rights, undermining the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments, uh, destroying Black Reconstruction, Plessy versus Ferguson, legalizing of segregation. The idea of states' rights has been used in defense of laissez-faire, opposing or weakening government regulations of business and that goes back to 1886 with the Santa Clara versus S Southern Pacific Railroad decision that made corporations have the, the legal rights of people. The constitution also prevented and as prevents or destroys unions. I'll get to that later. Um, the constitution has expanded the rights of the second amendment which is it's not only a gun control issue. Um, Carol Anderson in her most recent book argues that the real import of the second amendment was not control of guns. It was controlling slavery by allowing white vigilantes to be used to control and police uh, the Southern, Southern plantation system. The constitution also facilitated and Nick will be talking about this. Uh, it's it facilitated voters, it has, voter suppression throughout our history and gerrymandering. It has said, because of federalism, it said that this national, uh, national elections should be controlled by each individual states with their own rules, their own regulations, their own standards. And we're seeing that play out so viciously today. And certainly since the, the, the hoax and the big lie of the, the Trump regime. So we have more partisan and political control over the legislative process to run elections. And, and I think my, my uh, data is correct on this. It, it gets outdated about every 10 minutes. Uh, as of now, 400 bills are in 41 states and most of them are designed to undermine democracy. So in, in many ways we have, uh, I think we have Dracula has the keys to the blood bank. Uh, one of the things I should mention here is that the, the, if you look at something called trifectas of party politics or party control, that's just a terminology that political science uh, scientists use, 15 states are, are controlled by Democrats, the House, Senate, and the executive. 23 states are controlled, all three branches by or all, all three bodies by Republicans. That, that um, is a lot of power in the hands of a, uh, a biased system. I wanna argue now that our political system, the way it represents people in and of itself is not democratic. Either it doesn't represent the, the, it doesn't represent the cross section of who we are as a nation nor does it, because of, it does not represent who we are, the majority interests are routine, routinely ignored. We are 40% of this population are people of color. The Senate remains a white upper-class club. 66% are millionaires and billionaires with only 9% of the Senate are people of color, 9%. 41% of the House are millionaires and billionaires 22% are people of color. Now that house happens to be one of the better ones and it's still horrible. Because, be, because of the uh, Connecticut compromise out of the, uh, out of the constitutional convention, the house is based as we all know on, on population and the state, each state has two, uh, two members. That's a gross discrimination. Of large, by, of large states. California, 40 million people, 40 million. Vermont has 630,000. Wyoming, about 500,000. But we all still have the same amount of, of senators as, as uh, California. Today, in the Senate, 
Democrats represent, this is an amazing, this is amazing data. Senate Democrats represent 40 million more voters than the Senate Republicans do. And even though that's true, the, the Democrats just barely, and up until the last election, didn't control the Senate. You would think that that voting uh, population and that percentage would be, be more accurately reflected uh, in the Senate. It's not. Madison, by design, wanted this, that the Senate to be the most powerful body and therefore um, as, as, and keep a distance from the people. It wasn't, as we, as we all well know, 1913 in the, in the 17th Amendment that, that the, the, the Senate was got to be elected by popular vote. So how is that democracy? So in, under this system, whose interests will, will be most represented in first and foremost in Congress? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. The interests of those class of, of privilege, white caste, caste, and corporate privilege. And in my view, by and large, and there are exceptions, and there are some exciting exceptions going on in Congress. And also I should mention too, uh, that I'm talking about the federal system. I think we find more democracy in local politics and in state politics, at least some, in a state like Vermont, than we do anywhere else. Um, and that has to do, I think, in, in large measure because of the, the lack of or the infusion of money in, in the political process. In my view, in recent decades, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans have, have they seldom enacted policies that address true material interests of the majority. To wit, if you, if you look at the New Deal, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, it looks downright radical and, and, um, and seditious and certainly does in, in terms of the, 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 the political party, which is really a, a political cult, the Republicans. Um, according to two political scientists who wrote, wrote a, a landmark study in 2017, Gillins and Page, um, they, uh, they studied about 2,000 pieces of legislation and they tried to determine who had influence in creating and supporting and promoting that within Congress. Okay, hold on to your seats because you, you know, I'm sure you're going to be knocked over with a feather on this. So they ask basically the fundamental questions, who has the most influence over Congress, the people or business? Okay, take a wild guess. So business, according to their longitudinal study of about 2000 pieces of legislation, business had nearly twice the influence as the people. And they, go, they go on and they say the majority of American public actually have little influence over policy. Quote, policy making is dominated by powerful business organizations and a small number of affluent Americans. So how is that democratic? So one of the, uh, one of the things I used to love to do with my students in class when we're talking about these things is, is say, okay, I want you to conceptualize Congress now. Congress is no longer what it looks like today. It is something new. Imagine that now the majority of Congress is composed of the working class and the poor. Imagine that just all of a sudden, all right? Or suppose Congress mirrors the actual population of the country, because uh, I don't even have to ask for a lot in terms of gender, color, class, sexual orientation, age, et cetera. Okay, with that in your mind, you can answer this question for yourself. Imagine how, okay, you can stop now. It, it tolls for me. Imagine that. Imagine how the laws and our system of governance would change if who was in Congress more equally represented who we are as a nation. Now I'd like to turn to the connection between corporations and politicians, or as I call it, the not so grand alliance. And, and relying on and, and referring to Gillens and Page's work, you think about corporate influence. U.S. corporations um, have dominated the governing process. And this goes back really until the early days of our republic. Corporate interests in alliance with Congress construct a world built 
on the assumptions of unexamined privileges of the white, of class, and of the corporate entities. So what's the what's, what's the byproduct or the, what's the the upshot of this alliance? So what? So what? We have this alliance of important people uh, getting together, politicians and and corporations. Well, here's where uh, here's where I think. Uh, this impact is most undemocratically felt in our system. This alliance determines how the government operates fundamentally. The rules of legislating, oversight, investigation, who gets on committees. It also determines who gets to play in this, this system in a meaningful way, who can run for office, who can afford to run for office, and who, can, uh, who gets nominated for the cabinet and for uh, judicial nominees and the, on the court system federally and, and on the Supreme Court, of course. When the wealthy write the rules, their interests will be served first and foremost. A classic example of this, I think, which is not widely known, certainly not in the public, is uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which has done a prodigious job for years in uh, drawing up legislation, drawing up uh, power, uh, uh, drawing up uh, equations of power. I'm reminded of, of what uh, Adam Smith said in 1776. He and I went to school together. And in his book, The, Nation of, uh, the, the Wealth of Nations, he writes about how when you have a, a, an elite class that has political power, there something is created that's not healthy for society. Although in many ways he he defined this because he he, he was a because of the the kind of philosophy he had. He didn't really look at this as as particularly troublesome or problematic. Uh, but in the hands of somebody like me, I guess it is. So what he he calls who the, the master. He said there are masters of mankind, and that's his quote: masters of mankind. And in those days. It was the manufacturers and, and the, the traders, the merchants and the manufacturers. He said, when, when they have the power, they make certain that their own interests are, quote, most particularly attended to, unquote. I'll come back to this in a minute. A hundred years later, Karl Marx would call this a class analysis. All right, when it really comes from Adam Smith, the, uh, the architect, if you will, or the theorizer of, of modern capitalism. So where you find economic power, you find political power. This includes what issues are brought to the table and which ones are ignored, like fundamental issues of poverty, environmental protection, we get a lot of that, gun violence, we, we have in a lot of, of uh, efforts at that, homelessness and, and so forth. So all of that, it percolates up from a system that already is undemocratic and its expressions continue to replicate an undemocratic system. This also comes about with the whole notion of dark money. And I think people know what that is, unaccounted for money, money that's put into, injected into the system by corporations and wealthy people in order to influence legislation and so forth. Uh, or an example of that is and the Supreme Court ruled um, from 2000 and 2020, for 20 years, the, the corporations, uh, excuse me, the Supreme Court ruled on corporate interest 80 times in favor of corporate interest and zero times for the people on, on this particular scale in, in 20 years. Also, uh, Congress, the corporations and the courts have allied to do a number of other things. They protect dark money. They weaken or destroy the Seventh Amendment that allows juries to determine uh, what punishments corporations should have for violating their codes of conduct or their charters. This Congress corporation and court alliance destroys the federal, has destroyed the federal regulatory system. This is the real reason for conservatives' interest to control the courts, in my view. But anyway, we've decimated over the years the regulation, the regulatory system, when the when the foxes are are in the hen house, this system has created the ability to suppress the vote, the Koch machine, as I call it, the Koch brothers. There's only one left. Since 2004, the Koch brothers 
ran the largest dark money network, 17 allied groups funding legislation and candidates and court nominees. That along with the Heritage Foundation and, other, and other, a number of other uh, right-wing entities. So how is that, all of that democratic? Let me turn to the party system. I think our party system is a monopoly. It's not a democracy. It, it, it functionally is a two party dash one party monopoly, monopoly that functions to prevent viable alternative political parties and viable alternative ideas. Most of the ideas that are beyond the consensus, if you look at the Green New Deal, you look at other legislation, you look at paying for colleges and so forth, uh, they are all of these ideas are, are tend to be marginalized and, and fairly quickly marginalized uh, by the mass media and by uh, uh, mainstream politicians. So this system of a one party monopoly basically creates a couple of things, a number of things. One, it creates a Republican and Democratic consensus on capitalism as being the best system. It embodies corporate privilege that serve the interests of the wealthy. It defines what is politically acceptable, it defines a consensus by excluding alternative ideas and parties. We all extol us of a, a, a in Vermont, or a lot of us do in Vermont, extol the, the uh, advances that Bernie Sanders made in 2016 and 2020. But it's still, he's not going to be more than a footnote. He has energized people. He's gotten people to you know, run for office. He's energized a lot of people. But fundamentally, that has not, and I know this is going to piss off my liberal friends, that even though it stimulated youth votes and so forth, it has not fundamentally altered the structure of who we are as a governing system. This system, this, this party monopoly, forces a Hobbesian choice, a lesser of two evils dilemma that makes people themselves antagonistic to a new ideas and alternative parties. They are fearful of the spoiler effect. This party monopoly promotes personality over party. Excuse me. Party platforms and positions become meaningless. They're mutable or forgettable. The two-party monopoly in, in, in the end of this section causes voter alienation. It's not apathy. Why do we have such low voter turnout? I maintain that it's alienation and not apathy. It's because we don't have a, we don't have a party system broad enough or viable enough um, that will make people say, yeah, I should vote for, for you know, this part of this Democratic Socialist Party. No, because they'll say, no, no way are they going to win. They're not. It's impossible. So we, what you do is you create an alienated public and therefore an undemocratic system. A, a good way of highlighting this is just compare our system to the European system. Yes, the European system is changing. Yes, the European system is not perfect. But if you compare it to what, how our, the outcomes, the processes and the outcomes of what our system is, you get um, a European system of democratic socialist countries. They have viable multi-party systems that reflect a broader perspective of people's interests, including those people who are poor and working class and those people, oddly enough, will get out to vote because there is a party that will speak to their needs. The result of all this of a, of a more democratic system as a European system is you have a much higher voter turnout. You have a much stronger social network system as of, 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 of education, healthcare, housing, and employment. So people um, can lead, lead decent lives. And as a consequence, they have higher standards of living than, than the richest country in the world, the United States. Let me uh, conclude with uh, a little bit on the on the um, on the Supreme Court and why I think it's undemocratic, I think the obvious things you know it's un unelected. It's a life term. It's a highly and much more so certainly since the '60s after um, after Thurgood Marshall when he when he became a nominee, 
that the, the process became very political. It started to become political because of the first black on the, the court, potentially on the court. And that's when the, the, the real political processes of getting on the court um, came to be. The, the, so it's a highly political nomination process and there's ex excessive power. It is the most aristocratic branch, white male branch of government. Of the 113 justices, 106 were white or are or were white males, two were blacks or are or have been, and now five women. The founding fathers are conflicted about the proper role and the power of the Supreme Court. Jefferson feared that it would become the, the despotic branch. It's interesting that we have to rely on Jefferson, quote him as a slave owner, to talk about humanity and, and democracy. The anti-federalist founders felt unelected Supreme Court should not have the power to nullify an act of Congress. The law is unconstitutional. Congress, who represents the people, should be involved with changing that system. And there are many ways that you could do that. Um, the, uh, in 1803, Marbury versus Madison became a watershed for the power of the Supreme Court. That's when judicial review was established out, uh, out of basically out of thin air by, um, by John Marshall, the Chief Justice. Judicial review, as you know, gives the, the, the power of the, of the uh, courts to over the Supreme Court to overturn any law that they find unconstitutional. And it's very interesting. If you look for judicial review in the Constitution, don't bother. It's not in there. This was a concept that John Marshall came up with, along with Federalists in his party, uh, to bolster this, the power of the Supreme Court. And Jefferson felt that it was a judicial usurpation and a violation of separate, and not only Jefferson, but the Anti-Federalist. In a letter to Abigail Adams, Jefferson writes that if the Marbury versus Madison decision be sound, then indeed is our constitution a complete fellow to see a suicide pact, strong language. And quote, he goes on, a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, unquote. In 2015, another radical president, Jimmy Carter, said that we are an oligarchy because of the misuse of judicial review historically in this society. The Supreme Court in this, and then this will be my last section, uh, the Supreme Court has been a bulwark of corporate rights over human rights. Uh, the court has historically supported property rights over human rights with some notable exceptions, and I can go into those, but I don't have time. But, um, and also in a bulwark of the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause was the most adjudicated, I think I mentioned that, clause in the history of the Supreme Court, starting in 1819 with the Dartmouth College case whereby the Supreme Court said that New Hampshire couldn't take over Dartmouth College and make it a public college. They wanted to keep it a private college. So Supreme Court and corporations and Congress protects uh, corporate rights over human rights. Corporate, corporate personhood, uh, 1886, as I mentioned in the Santa Clara decision, in the era, it was called the Lochner era from the 1890s, 1937, the courts were so active that they, they defined this specifically as a, as a, as a pro-corporate time where any, go any government regulation, state or federal, mm -hmm. to control wages or hours or working conditions or child labor was thrown out a violation a federalism, a violation of the Commerce Clause. I, I want to send something to the chat. I want to send... Would you mute yourself, Neil? Yeah, I will. Um, the, uh, the Supreme Court undermines labor unions. And there's, there's a long history of that. We've, uh, the Supreme Court took the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and took it and, made, and transformed it from a, from a device, a law to control corporates, corporations and trusts and turned it into an anti-union mechanism to bust unions. 
uh, Taft-Hartley of 1947, the single most anti-union law was endured, was upheld uh, numerous times by the Supreme Court. To it, the, the overall um, result of all this is the United States has the lowest rate of unionization in the developed world. About 6% of American workers are in, have the benefit of unions. The high point wasn't very high, but it was 35% in the 1950s. This, this Supreme Court, this Congress uh, over time has destroyed campaign finance regulations. Money is now speech under the corporate personhood. This court and the Congress has been the enemy of civil rights uh, all the way back to the 19th century and supportive of Jim Crow. And as one constitutional observer and author wrote, the Roberts Court of today was the most pro-corporate, pro-deregulation, anti-voting court in the history of the United States. Hell, Roberts looks makes uh, Roger B. Taney look like a civil libertarian or ACUL, a -A -C -C -L -U member. Taney was the one who wrote the Dred Scott decision declaring that, that uh, blacks are not human beings. So let me conclude. I maintain, I'll say it straight out, while there are, there are, we do have aspects of democracy more on the local level, I would say, we are a plutocracy. We are a country ruled by the wealth. And these structural and historical aspects of our system constitute overall a, a, a bulwark against democracy. Determining, if we determine, having said that, Determining that we do not have a democracy does not preclude the possibility of creating a democracy. This is where I end on a positive note. Plutocracies and oligarchies can be transformed, but we can't use the same damn system that is diseased to try to change the system, in my view. Real democracy is a, is a process that requires perpetual maintenance. It is a, it is a system that the goal, in my view, should be a democratic, socialist, political economy that enables real democracy to flourish. And here endeth the evening lesson. Thank you. We would love to hear some comments. Well, I think maybe we should go with Nick. Yeah, but maybe I'll just kick in and uh, okay, see if I can get through in time for uh, everybody before we go to bed. Um, so uh, Tim's uh, analysis of the Constitution and, and its, uh, its motivation has much to do with what I was also to be, but, but I to avoid uh, repeating directly. Um, however, there's, there's something that has struck me that I think is worth reflecting upon. The Declaration of Independence, you know, uh, the, the famous words of uh, Jefferson, uh, uh, every, every human man deserves uh, inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But th those were, I realized uh, recently, I mean, I, well, I've, I've known this a lot, but I, those were jargon. Those were, that was jargon. It's called uh, the Parisian salons, the Scottish Rite, Masonic temples. Uh, we're, we're saying those words uh, routinely, and and Jefferson was one of them. He was a uh, he was a Mason, thirty three degree Mason. Uh, you know, repeating jargon. But he and his his friends in the Second Continental Congress, they they understood that they had been resisting British invasions on their property and their property rights, the Tea Party being a, a great example, for some years. In 1775, uh, George Washington was stationed in, in somewhere between Lexington and Concord, consistently revolting against the British. There was an underground war underway in 1775 not so underground, really. And in July 4, 1776, when the Declaration of Independence is proclaimed, what 
are the 56 people in Faneuil Hall really thinking? They know they don't have any money. They don't. They're all kind of indebted to England. But they have this promise of equality and, in, and inalienable rights to like liberty and the pursuit of happiness, which they know is a very motivational idea. And so when they pronounce the Declaration of Independence, they know they're also calling for war against the nation with the largest military force on earth. So they, they have to know that this is a, a gamble, a serious gamble, but it works. Five years down the road, Britain surrenders and, and, and all the Revolutionary War veterans go home. And what, what do they go home with? Five years of fighting? Uh, they go home with this piece of paper, a promissory note that says you'll be paid X, Y, and Z. And they get back to wherever they're from and they find that there's no real money behind those promissory notes. And they actually, if they're promised $100, they come home with two to $7. And it's, it's, it's a fact that we don't talk about, think about too much, but I think it's quite egregious. And, uh, you know, this promise of uh, civil rights, et cetera. So there really wasn't much that came out of the war from the perspective of the people who fought it, except this idea of democracy, which certain places like Vermont and Rhode Island and Pennsylvania immediately wrote these constitutions of their own for their states, giving all men, white men only, of course, white men only, the right to vote if they paid any tax whatsoever. You didn't have to own property. You just had to pay the poll tax, whatever land, you know, tax there were. If you were a taxpayer in Vermont, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania in 1783, you were a voter. And the, the voters of Rhode Island quickly formed a party called the Country Party that became a majority in 1786. And the first laws they created were laws to create paper money combined with other laws or regulations compelling all bankers, merchants, and creditors to accept the paper money so that they could pay the Revolutionary War soldiers what they were owed. And at that, John Adams in Boston went, uh, we'll just call it ape, uh, called it unlivable, and uh, he and his uh, compatriot, uh, Henry Knox, who was still the Secretary of War, started writing letters to their friends like George Washington. And out of that moment of, of uh, upper class uh, fear that these people were gonna be democratic, they're, look, they're acting dem democratically and they're doing what we were afraid of the most. And out of that fear, came the Constitutional Convention and the Constitution. And in the Constitutional Convention, Matt, father, mostly because he showed up at the convention in 1787 with a blueprint in his hand. And the convention ultimately approved about 85% of that original document. So Madison came and he was the guy with the ideas. And he says this, the rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest, he proclaimed on the convention hall. They always did, they always will. And yet I could read that, and I think we should, as a sentence of, of self-criticism. But then, you know, he turns the corner and looks at the non-property majority and, 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 the, and the most important issue uh, that, that really is that they're engaged in at the Constitutional Convention, which is who gets to vote, who gets to play, who gets to participate, whose democracy is this? And <clears throat> so Madison then goes on to say, extend the rights of suffrage equally to all and the rights of property 
may be overruled by a majority without property. That to me is in one sentence, the more or less eternal fear of the rich with regard to democracy. I think I submit basically in the end and in the beginning, voter suppression is about social class conflict waged by the wealthy to protect property and privilege against and from the unwealthy majority. When, you know, several decades ahead, uh, white men with power began to move against slavery and toward integration of American blacks into the body politic. Madison's refrain against universal suffrage. In 1858, South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond blustered on the Senate floor, quote, our slaves do not vote. We gave them no political power. Yours do vote. And being the majority, they are depositories of all your political power. If they knew the tremendous secret that the ballot box is stronger than an army with banners, where would you be? Your society would be reconstructed, your government overthrown, your property divided, not with arms in their hands, but by the quiet process of the ballot box. Senator Hammond demonstrated the ham-handedness or dim-wittedness uh, all too common among American politicians. He suggested that there were slaves in the North and in 1858, there were none, there were only free blacks. More interestingly, he assumed Northern blacks constituted a majority of the population. They didn't, they didn't even comprise 1% of the Northern population. But in South Carolina, three of every five human beings were slaves, which is to say there were three slaves to every white people, two white people rather, <laughs> three slaves to every two whites. Imagine the fear South Carolinian whites might have felt at the prospect of freeing an enslaved majority. Imagine how guilt plays with fear in such a situation. Senator Hammond did not speak directly to fears of violent reprisal. Instead, he spoke to the fears he calculated in fellow senators north and south, of a propertyless majority gaining the right to vote. Senator Hammond injected race into the central class conflict of the Constitution, the conflict between wealth and democracy. Demographically uninformed as he was, Senator Hammond understood the first principle of government in the United States that the protection of property overrides civil rights and that the formula for protecting property centers on restricting the rights and power of the voting majority. Currently, right now, non-white citizens constitute a demographic majority in many locations and will in 20 years be a majority nationwide. Sponsors of the Republican Party Charles Koch and Ilk, happily supported Donald Trump's playing havoc with this incontrovertible fact. Ginning up politics of grievance filled with replacement theory, cancel culture, and critical race theory histrionics. The conflation of race with social class a political contrivance since Senator Hammond and the Civil War has worked well for the upper class. It is a fusion that impugns people of color as universally lower class and insinuates upper class status onto racists. 
It's a neat political trick that has turned Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and QAnon followers into happy foot soldiers for counterfeit doctrines manipulated by Fox News, Trumpster politicians, and silent partners in the alphabet soup of right-wing super PACs and think tanks. It transforms Trump's political base into unwitting protectors of the economic status quo. And it feeds the big lie with racist assumptions of black and immigrant voting fraud, providing fraudulent rationalizations for voter suppression, the success of which supporters conclude <laughs> is the only way to stave off a black republic and a socialist one at that. America is embroiled and in the midst, in its midst every day is the other sure fact of the present, climate crisis and its daily catastrophes. The United States is showing itself incapable of self-governing in a way that far surpasses the misgivings of George Washington, Henry Knox, et cetera, in 1786. Poll after poll show overwhelming majorities in favor of massive infrastructural renewal, universal health care, and climate action. And what happens? Partisan paralysis in Congress, hopeful words from the White House. The most telling fact is this, through a year and a half of pandemic, millionaires and billionaires have profited vastly while income for the rest has declined. Over the last 14 months, the roughly 700 billionaires in these United States have increased their combined wealth by approximately $1.6 trillion. Let's think what that is. $1.6 trillion is over one and a half million more millions of dollars to be distributed among 700 people. It is functionally impossible to fathom how much money that is. Uh, the veteran activist and uh, scholar Chuck Collins, um, some of you might know him, recently uh, wrote a really nice, a good article for the Commons uh, on wealth inequality. He says, as wealth and power concentrates, the wealthy deploy their power to further shape the rules, news, and society, or, and culture of society. They block popular reforms by capturing the political system and, and ensuring dysfunctional gridlock. And that is where we're at. And there's very little democracy in it. So we have to remember that America and its democracy began with, with the uh, propaganda of the Declaration of Independence promising democracy in order to get you know, men without any property all throughout the land to fight the British and then to come home and get nothing for it. Democracy began as a con as much as it did as a promise to the people. When colonists in Rhode Island began acting and Massachusetts with the Shays Rebellion, they began acting as if they lived in a democracy, George Washington and the founders took it away, substituting a representative republic with all the barriers that Tim talked about to functional democracy. Moments of democratic expansion have arisen, again, as Tim referenced, as in 1776, they did, so too they did in the Civil War and in the 1930s depression. And then we have the updated modern civil rights movement, et cetera. These are the moments of democracy that we can celebrate, but they are moments. The primary weapon in the toolbox of constraining democracy has been voter suppression, which we are witnessing wholesale today. The only certainty that we can be, can, we can have 
is that this brew of gridlock, grievance, inequality, and climate crisis cannot long stand. And so my uh, turn to uh, the upbeat uh, to conclude is that, damn, I hope like the Minutemen in Lexington, the Black Brigades of the Civil War, auto workers in Detroit, and everybody in Mississippi in 63 can get together one more time and join in building the next democratic moment. And I hope some people have something to say. Thanks very much for listening to us. Thank you, Nick. Any comments? Yeah, I have a comment. Can you hear me? This is Neil Sr. Neil, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Neil is from Brattleboro. OK, so I'm Neil Sr. I'm from Brattleboro. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. OK, I, the presentation was great. But I have, you know, because I'm a pain in the ass, I need to make a provocative comment, which is, on the one hand, allegedly, this is the greatest country in the world. And on the other hand, it has a failed democracy. And yet, so the question is, does democracy help a country be great? I mean, that's one way to phrase it. Um, I thought what was presented tonight was terrific. In no way I want to disparage it. But the bottom line is that there's all these other quote unquote democracy, like, like New Zealand around the, around the world who have, you know, great social programs, but they're not regarded as great economies. And so the question I, again, the question I have is what's the relationship between democracy and a great economy? Because we don't have democracy, but yet we have allegedly we're allegedly the most powerful country in the world. I, I'll respond to that. Um, I, I don't accept your premise of great economy or great society. Um, I, I think uh, what we've outlined in terms of what the, uh, the product and what the outcomes that this system produces can cannot be described as great. You know, maybe for me, a white upper middle class male who grew up in that kind of environment, sure, yes. Even the pandemic didn't hit me very hard, all right? But you think about 40% uh, of the population that is uh, non-white, that doesn't mean they're all poor by any means, but there are plenty of, this is plenty of working class and poor in our society. We have the, we have the highest rate of poverty in the industrialized world, the highest rate of childhood poverty in the world. So the outcomes for this system, whether it be the large economic system um, or the quote democracy, the outcomes are horrendous, right. they're terrible. And so I think the premise in my view is wrong. Okay, so the other way to say it, I think, is what we present as a country of being a great country is actually a facade. And it's, it's not, it's a facade. Yes. It's not true. Yes. Right. Right. And yep. so the question is, how come we present ourselves as a great country? The only way I think we can do that is from a military point of view. But from a social point of view, internally, it's horrific. You know, we still have the death penalty. We have huge numbers of people unemployed. We have terrible... Uh, uh, social programs, but when people say the United States is a great country, I think what they're talking about is our ability to go out and invade other countries. May I, I'm going to make a comment. Um, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a, an ongoing, long-running, lifelong uh, debate with my father um, about these issues, and uh, and he always sat back on his heels ultimately um, and he said, you know, I don't care what you say, Nick. Um, this nation has made more money for more people than has ever been created across time in any geographic location. Exactly. 
And, and, and that's the luck of, of its location combined with the brutality and cruelty of its uh, upper class. Uh, and he's, he's not wrong. And, and then I, I combine that with a history of, uh, of, of going in and out of Latin America quite frequently and knowing how many people want to come to the United States and they know that this is no goddamn democracy and this is no fun place to be. But this is one place that they could make more money than they can in Mexico, in Ecuador, in Peru, et cetera. And, and, and so th that's just a kind of, uh, if you want to get going on exceptionalism, the material resources, the natural resources of the United States are exceptional. Um, they have been historically. Um, they're about to be completely ended, but, uh, but until, <laughs> until, you know, last 20 years anyway, they have been capable of expansion allowing people illegally and legally. And let me tell you, at least half of our economy is completely illegal, has been at least for a hundred years. It, and slavery, is that legal? Whatever. Um, but it still creates, why do people come to America? No, not because it's goddamn democratic. No. Right. I think as I listen to all this, um... I think of that uh, popular phrase that uh, uh, freedom is nothing left to lose. And uh, I was uh, thinking about that because in spite of standing here and watching this uh, train wreck on the way, we will do that until it actually wrecks. And we won't be liberated until the grocery stores are empty. <laughs> Spoon, I want to, uh, I want to introduce you. Spoon is a uh, resident of Brattleboro, Vermont. Yes, uh, and, and Spoon Agave uh, in Brattleboro. That's a good point, Spoon. Uh, until we hit bottom, uh, it takes a lot to get a social movement really uh, running. But do we have to get there? Does it have to be that? I mean, is that your, is that your scent? I mean, are you prom uh, promoting that? You just... any, uh, ex examples otherwise, because to, they're, they're a very powerful and very well armed forces uh, d defending at the disposal of the ruling class. And as we see, they don't hesitate to use that force in as large of a scale as they need to. So changing the rules is a very dangerous business. And um, what are you willing to risk? Uh, uh, it, uh, when you're as comfortable as I expect everybody on the screen is, how much will you risk? And so far, it's almost nothing. That's why we're back to the land. <laughs> Other comments, observations, challenges? Uh, Just well, go ahead. Just go ahead. So, you know, I jumped in with a chat about the role of religion in this country, uh, which wasn't discussed at all. But ultimately, there's the whole current discussion about the big lie. And the question that I have in my head, which is, you know, microscopic, is has to do with the power of religion to make uh, policy changes. I mean, you, you talked about and very eloquently about economics. Uh, but there's another aspect. And so economics in my you know, this, I'm simplistic, but economics are intellectual. And then there's this morality issue, which has to do with religion. And I didn't hear you talk about that. And I do think that religion, at the moment, I in my chat, 
six of the nine, uh, whatever they are, Supreme Court judges might as well be priests and, and nuns. Mm -hmm. They're Catholic. And there's this whole issue in this country about belief in the whatever, you know, whatever doesn't exist. And we talk about Trump's big lie, but I think it's worth going back a, a step and saying, what about the big lie of religion mm -hmm. and the, the role of religion in this country? So it's, I, I stick it out there as a, as, a, as a position, and as Caitlin says, an obnoxious position. But what's your feeling about how faith has, has basically molded this country into morality, a morality which has to do with... Um, I know about God, you don't know about God, um, you don't pursue the God that I pursue. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, Antonio Gramsci's work uh, in the, the 1930s, primarily 20s and 30s, as Italian radical theorist who was, who was fighting against, uh, against Mussolini. And he talked about cultural hegemony. And he talked about all the forces that really form form our ideas that socialize us right. in our minds, our values and so forth. And religion is certainly part of that. So I would, I would, I would put that absolutely as a, a critical part of whatever this is, whatever the, the waves are. Um, <laughs> but let me also say that when I was conceptualizing this presentation, I just uh, I sat down and, and wrote out, I uh, came up with, I think about 24 different structural defects to our system, right. and I said I'm going to talk about four of them. Yeah, I'm not, in no yeah. way, is, in no way, this is the criticism. No, I know that, I know that, but and it's certainly that's worthy of of uh, you know books and well, it has already been written, of course, but, right. but discussion for sure. Right. So it, that's an important point to make. Yes. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Mary. Actually, I was going to let Garrett go because he tried to jump in before, and then I'll go mm -hmm. after Garrett. No, you go, Mary. I'm, I'm, I was speaking to the subject prior to religion. So go ahead. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not speaking to religion because I was raised Irish in a Catholic neighborhood where nobody knew we weren't raised Catholic. So I don't have anything to say about. You're all the same. Right. So I'm not going to speak to that. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us somewhere else. All right. Well, all I was, I'll, I'll keep this short. All I was going to say is in response to the the great the greatest country in the world thing. It's probable that all the empires said that, right? Genghis Khan right. probably said that, the Chinese certainly said that, the right. Dutch said that, the British said that, the Spanish said that. It's right. not the country that's great, at least in our recent 100 years or so, 150. It's that we're an empire, we control the world, and that's great in the sense of big. Right. right? Yeah. That's a great comment. I don't know if you just saw, I, I can't shut up, um, but uh, we just left Afghanistan and we just left the Borgham Air Force uh, base and we left it at 3 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Mm. And we abandoned the base to the uh, Afghanis. We left them a whole bunch of, of um, I don't know, Ford pickups and a, and a couple of hundred armored vehicles, but we didn't even tell them we were leaving. The greatest country in the world is just we spent 20 years in and we have to leave in the middle of the night. That's well, they had a farewell plan for us and uh, we were so humble we didn't want to stay for it. And that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> they had a cake. Right? Good, right. <laughs> I noticed uh, Tim Bach uh, wants to wanted to speak. Tim, are you there? Tom. Um, no, I'm sorry. Just a, just a couple of observations. I, yeah. I'm a representative uh, in the Vermont legislature. I represent four towns in Windsor County. I live in Chester. This is my uh, third term. And uh, I, I, it's really great to join you. I, I'm reminded that um, uh, one of my observations in the legislature, and I, I thank Tim for thinking that we're more democratic than other legislatures, but there's a real... Um, sameness and similarity in um, cultural and economic backgrounds uh, that I've observed in the legislature. 
uh, it's, it's kind of uh, amazing how much we are the same. Yeah. And it's kind of scary. Uh, I, I don't know. We aren't representing everybody specifically. We think we are. We think we can re represent the poor. But we have our own agendas. And uh, it's, it's there. The other thing uh, is an observation is, uh, I don't know if everybody's aware, but I think I've talked with uh, Tim Kipp about it, but uh, the power of, uh, of, of businesses even in our little legislature. There are more lobbyists than there are legislators. Uh -huh. And they're with us all the time. They're talking to us all the time. They're uh, um, testifying all the time. And we're not stupid. Uh, we think we're pretty smart, but we have a difficult time when they present cases to us to look for the alternative. We know that they're giving us a point of view, but to find the underside of that point of view is sometimes very difficult. And we have to be uh, alert. Uh, the third thing I'm going to talk about is religion. I just I want to give you the other side of religion. I in the legislature you'll find people that um, the people that are quite religious tend to be uh, interested in, in, in single issues, um, abortion, uh, things like that. There's also a view uh, among some of them that God is God guides us. Guides, God is guiding uh, us in our legislation. That's kind of interesting. But uh, uh, one thing I have noticed about all religious people, I think, and it's positive. I think they all are willing to serve. They all feel an obligation to serve. And I think that's important. And I think that comes out of their religion. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it's, um, I can't say that they don't, but who do they share with? I didn't say share. I said they're willing to serve. Uh, if you look at these people, they, they've been on select boards, they've been on all manner of groups, they're uh, active in their own communities, they're now in the legislature. Uh, they, they're, those, they have a desire to serve, and I think it comes out of their religion. I, that's the only thing I can figure. So I, I think that's a positive that, side. I made that comment from something I read in... Uh, Robert Putnam's book, uh, Bowling Alone, in which uh, he was looking at that question of um, uh, religious affiliation and community spirit, I guess is a very rough way to put it. And um, he said that, uh, I forget whether he said there was an uptick or a downtick in uh, in religious um, affiliation, but but he pointed out that the largest uptick was among the evangelists, and they were very insular, very much uh, very sharing and loving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just within their small uh, uh, congregations, and not very open to the outside world. Well. My observation, I'll stick with it, with uh, legislators that are evangelists, that are Catholics, whatever they are, Jews, um, tend to be willing to serve. And uh, that's my observation. I'd like to hear Mary. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs> thanks, Teresa. It's nice to see you. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nick and Tim, for your as always, diligent and thoughtful presentation. And it's given me a lot to think about, particularly at this uh, moment of someone's Independence Day. <clears throat> um, let, me, let me introduce you, Mary. Oh, yeah, go ahead. This is Mary Gannon. <laughs> and you live in Winchester? I live in Winchester, New Hampshire. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. glad to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, so just quickly, I, I just wanted to, um, I'm just this interesting conversation about the religious piece because I don't think of myself as a religious the identified person at all. And, and yet I serve in lots of capacities. Um, and it's great to see you, Tom Bach up yeah. there in Chester. Um, and some of the work that I do is directly with the legislature in Vermont, even though I live over here in New Hampshire. So we're trying to get the legislature to examine policy making and um, legislation through a racial and social justice lens. How do they think about policy? How do they construct policy when they're talking about serving the people 
and we're asking them to think about who are the people that they are serving and who gets left out of that, who gets left out of that picture. Um, so I wanted to go back to something that Tim, you said earlier, and I just needed to name it. Um, so if some of you know that of the work that I do, and I tend to come at this from a um, more kind of, I guess I would describe it as like humanistic education or uh, social sciences, thinking a lot about the impact on people and how it shows up for people, how issues of oppression show up for people um, and the ways that they and behave in community, how they are given access to resources and community. And Tim, you said something, you started to re reference this idea of internalized oppression or the ways in which oppression impacts uh, marginalized folks. I'm not sure exactly, but I was, I was interested in exploring that because one of the things we talk about in social justice education and in critical race theory which I know is, we're not supposed to talk about that here, um, is how we internalize those kinds of messages and what happens to us as human beings when we internalize the messages of inferiority. And a lot of what we talk about in humanistic education is the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy. So a lot of what we get fed in the media from our social institutions, religion being one of them, schools, the government, different sectors of the government, the criminal justice system, education. We all get fed particular messages about who we are as people. We get those whether we're from privileged dominant groups or not. So I believe that we also, as human beings, who as for someone like myself who is white, I was fed a real strong message about my internalized superiority, that I had the right to certain things. And I didn't have to, um, that I was, that the system was set up for me. And what we know is that the system is not set up for those who are currently in this current moment struggling in lots of different levels. So, so I just wanted to name that because as much as we talk about the systemic structural systems, what we see is the manifestation of how that shows up in human beings in their understanding of themselves and their belief systems about themselves. And then how oftentimes that becomes enacted. And one of the ways we could see that I think is when we look at the incarceration rates we have in this country of black and brown men between the ages of 18 and 25. And so those are just some things that I'm thinking about as we're talking about systems. And, and what, I, what I keep thinking about for my own work is so this is all so important and what do we do? Like, how do we even on these local kind of community levels, um, spheres of, where are spheres of influence and how we address some of that? And one thing that I've been doing a lot of work in Vermont is working directly with select boards, talking with select boards in towns across the state around what is their responsibility and their role in making sure the communities are safe and welcoming because people talk about that and they say that's their core value, but oftentimes what is happening in the community doesn't match up to that, so. Maybe yeah, it's not thoughts. Thank you. Role. I don't know what happened. Can I make a comment? Maybe it's not the role of the select board. Uh, we may have mistakenly placed our, our faith or our, our power in the wrong place. Don, would you like to say something? I would, thank you. Uh, I'm Don Hebert. I live here in Brattleboro. Thank you, Don. Uh, this has been a very amazing discussion. Um, and I'd like to pick up a little bit from what Mary was just saying about how individuals are affected. And one of the things that fills me with concern and some you know, bafflement as to how we get out of this fix is in addition to the systemic um, situation that we had that Tim was describing and some of the outcomes that Nick was describing is, um, you know, currently we have, one of the big things that influences people are stories, the stories that we tell ourselves. And, uh, you know, storytelling goes way back. You know, it's a very primitive uh, part of ourselves and very powerful. And the and now we're in a society that is 
uh, endlessly telling itself stories. We have movies, we have TV, we have internet, we have social media. And these, many of these stories are, I think, really um, exacerbating our situation, creating tribalism. We have, you know, the media bubbles that groups put themselves into so that all they hear is the echo chamber of their own, uh, their own views, they're amplified. Uh, the biggest movies right now are superhero movies where we have lone rangers with superpowers. Um, what is that? That's really saying something weird about our culture. And, um, and the social media, you just have a phone. I mean, I get caught myself looking at my phone and looking at Facebook or looking at some movie snippet. Um, it's feeding something and I don't think it's healthy. Um, I just wanted to point that out as something that is, is bothering me quite a bit. Thank you. Just a quick comment, Don. I, that is such a rich portrayal of a very deep problem that um, God, we could spend you know the rest of our lives on that. But it surely has to be acknowledged and talked about. It'd be a great topic for just one one topic for you know at least for one of these sessions. But it is absolutely critical to our our consciousness. Yes. Um. I have something to say. I just would like to say a couple things, respond to what Mary said. I think um, she's proof of the pudding and that her Catholic background, indeed, is causing her to serve. And I think that's part of the reason she serves. Okay. I, would, I would bet money on that. We would dissect her somehow. We'd find that to be true. But uh, the other thing is uh, she talked about how, how does social justice and social equity um, um, get into the society, get into local policy. And I, I will tell you an important thing that happens and it happened in our legislature uh, this year, the speaker got all the Democrats together and this is very, very important. She said, I wanna see some policy. I wanna see some bills regarding social justice and social equity. And when that happens, things move. So it's leadership in the, on those important issues that kind of create the beginning of the train. And just today, I'm, I'm chairman of our local regional planning. I had lunch with uh, our, our local director and he said, Tom, well, how they've got the, the word has come down to our local uh, regional planning. They've got to do something in terms of social justice, social equity. What can we do? We're, we're planning. How can we bring that in? I said, when you go into those towns and you help them with planning, you make sure their town plans, plans address social justice and uh, address social equity. And that's the, that's the beginning. That's the beginning in town plans. So that's how it's done. Whether it's adequate, I don't know, but that's how it's been done. That's wonderful to hear. One thing we lack are, are measurements or standards. Um, uh, every year we get uh, a long list of legislation that was passed and every every member of the uh, assembly goes home and they talk about the wonderful things they did. Uh, but every year there's more poverty uh, in Vermont. Healthcare is going in the wrong direction entirely. Housing is getting out of control, um, et cetera, et cetera. Unemployment's not coming together. Um, every major aspect of uh, every significant major aspect of our social well-being is under threat or declining. And but we have a long list of accomplishments of our legislature. Teresa, go ahead. Um, I'm Teresa Healy. I live here in Brattleboro. And um, I really appreciated, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't hear the full presentations. I wasn't expecting something to start at 6.30. <laughs> so I didn't pay close attention to the start time, but I, um, I really liked the presentations and, and it really made me think about, you know, the, the importance of uh, how do we value as socialists um, how do I value the role of political institutions in a liberal democracy? And I think that political institutions are actually very important because as um, Tim was saying at the end there that, uh, that democracy 
isn't like a state of being it's a process it's um it's like democratization is what interests me because it's a kind of like an ongoing kind of a, a, a need for political engagement and and there's so many ways that 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 can happen like it really matters in the european systems that they have proportional representation you know that really really matters for their party system um and so sometimes I think, okay, well, what if we were to con really think about uh, elections and uh, what was struck me, like I, I'm unfamiliar with exactly how the constitution would deal with this in the United States, but what, what would be the, the possibility of democratic leaning states forming some kind of an alliance so even if there couldn't be a federal electoral commission, could there be standards that could be agreed upon between states for elect electoral reform and kind of build a block, you know, because that's how it was done in Canada with, with uh, as I'm sure you know, that um, with public health care, it came out of the province of Saskatchewan and then it built from there um, as the public support and the and the and the political strength grew for, for that. So that that kind of you know occurred to me as an idea after the election or during the electoral period. Well, there's so many bizarre things that happen here in terms of elections. Um, the idea of having a, a kind of a block of states that are like-minded. I know I'm presuming that the federal government can't can't regulate this, but there's so many differences that maybe there could be some kind of alliance an alliance built over time for electoral reform, even if it can't happen from the center or the top down. So anyway, that's just a, an example of how I think that, that political institutions matter. I also think that it's important when we're dealing with structural things to be looking for contradictions because it's true that there are these uh, overwhelming structural forces that, uh, that are bearing down on upon, upon us and have been for centuries, um, but in the processes of democratization as people become act activated and, and organized collectively uh, and and come up with different ideas about, about possibilities um, things things shift things things shift and so if we look at the contradictions like you know there's pipelines being uh cancelled right now that's really interesting in the context of the climate crisis in the context of the fires in the context of the extraordinary heat and everything else that's going on what are the contradictions mm -hmm. for for power relations and for their, you know, seemingly impermeable uh, power structure, well, they're, they're full of cracks. They're not that. They're they're not all that together. You know, like they do have strategies, but there's holes. Like, um, and I think, as Mary said, what are the, the points of the spheres of influence? But that's the. I think that that is really important um, counterweight to us uh, in our understanding of structural power uh, to try to figure out. The way that Steve Bannon did figured out the importance of the administrative state. And he went on and on and on about the administrative state, which you know I can tell you from a Canadian perspective, a lot of Canadians, um, except those of, of whom are in the public sector, um, don't really want to get involved in, in the tedious activities of, of um, boards and um, commissions or hearings, as Tom said, you know, um, paying attention to the legislative calendar. Um, so I, I'm sorry, bl blathering a little bit, but um, maybe it's just those two points that, uh, well, three points that democratization is a process, that democracy is a process, that that we we need to look for contradictions in structural power, and that um, political institutions actually matter quite a bit. In the 1930s, Rexford Tugwell, who was part of uh, Roosevelt's Brain Trust, suggested a new form of feder federation that they should be federated as smaller entities and instead of states they should be clusters of states that would be called a state or whatever the hell you call it as a way of managing uh more uh more of the the, the governing process so i just throw that out um as as things you know as people have tried to you know, uh, approach what you're saying. And I think what you're saying is absolutely important and valid. I have to go, but thank you all. It was a pleasure. Thanks, John.
Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I always enjoy uh, when somebody raises the, the issue and the question of a contradiction. Um, so you make reference to the pipeline, a pipeline, I'm not sure which one you meant to, there are a couple that are under siege or at, you know, under the microscope. Um, and the contradiction about shutting one down is only that the people with the money who invested in it and, and look to still gain from it are in, in uh, opposition to uh, organic life, as far as I can see. And the question remains, as it has been in at least these United States, what has more power, money or civil rights? And so if, if we can blow that into the, uh, you know, th th then that becomes the, the situation that we face because pipelines are a massive example of the continuing destruction of the possibility of life. And if we can't somehow make that completely, you know, in our soul, if we don't understand that in our soul, when, you know, uh, this contradiction is not going anywhere. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you infuse that unless we get to where Spoon keeps talking about, you know, it, you know, when we lose everything, then we start to get motivated to get something back to survive. And so I think we're setting ourselves up to uh, some, some penury of a fairly serious level. Or we could just lose everything. Yeah, hardly. we could just lose everything. Doesn't mean that we become politically active. Right. Well, we're dead when we lose everything. In yeah. fact, uh, in a democracy, I think the underlying premise is that all power belongs to the people exclusively, and they, the people, delegate what powers and authority they wish to whom they wish and under what circumstances they wish. So in fact, all the people in your community may exercise their power. They don't need, need to ask the select board if there can be a community meeting. They are the community. They don't need to ask a town manager if they can have a meeting. I don't know where he's going. No, no, he's good. So I'll, I'll respond to that, Spoon, thanks. Um, and I'm not sure if you're thinking of something in particular, like particularly with some of the, what I think have been incredibly rich and also challenging conversations in Brattleboro around the role of the community in, for example, the community safety review. Um, so, I mean, just to be clear, I, I am a, a, a large, advocate of that. I'm a huge advocate of community involvement. And when I'm talking about some of the work that I'm doing with select boards, school boards, uh, my colleague Dottie Morris and I did a huge project with the town of Brattleboro as an example. Um, I think where I, I know that our, our framework is about getting leadership. Somebody talked about leadership earlier. Like how do you get leadership where, and again, this is not, um, we're not, you know, and we're talking about hierarchical systems here. So it's not power sharing by any means, um, but it is about getting le leadership to have some understanding when they talk about their core values in a community as being respect, inclusion. I mean, some of these people will talk about this. They'll say, these are our core values. This is why we ran for select board. This is what we believe in the town of Waterbury or the town of Putney or wherever we've been. But then we begin to look at how the policies and practices, the way that decisions get made, the way that town community members are not asked to engage in certain conversations. 
we begin to see that the core values that they espouse are not matching up to the actual practice or what shows up in the community. And for me, that's kind of the beginning conversation, particularly with folks who of privilege, who are often resistant and don't feel like they should, they, that they need to have this conversation. That as far as they're concerned, well, we only got a few black and brown folks here. So, or we only have a few people in wheelchairs. So we don't really have to think about the sidewalks or whatever it might be. Um, so absolutely community involvement. And I would support, you know, in some of these communities where I'm working, the community organizations are the ones that are bringing this forward to these elected officials. They're bringing it forward to the state ledge. So I don't know, I guess I feel like I can't go down the rabbit hole of what happens when the grocery stores are empty. I've got an eight, we've have an 18 year old, you know, I do a lot of work with youth. I've got to think about how are we creating strategies and opportunities to move the needle forward. And I think we all have a part in that. So we can sit and just talk about it. But I think we all have a part in thinking about, and I wish we had more folks on these forums. Like right now, it's like speaking to the converted, right? Like we want more people in the conversation who don't understand that when we're all doing better, we're all doing better. When we all feel safe, in the community, we're all doing better. It's not just for people from these marginalized categories that we often talk about. We benefit from it as well. It's a great point, Mary. Uh, I would like to say, uh, Mary referred a lot to they and them as the leadership. And as long as you say they and them, it is they and them. You can organize a bunch of people in town and have a town meeting. You could and and maybe you could abolish your select board or do all sorts of things. So so leadership is is more a matter of stepping forward uh, because we are the citizens. We are the people. All of this is our our power. And we just have to make sure that um, everybody agrees or uh, most people agree. But we certainly don't have to worry about the leadership agreeing. Well, that, that's, that's a great point. That, I, I just want to say thank you, Spoon. I, I hear you and my husband sitting next to me like, that's a great point. That's a great point. And you know, I wish we saw more of that. I think for me, I'll just say quickly and then I want to hear Nick, is what I, what I constantly struggle with is is how do we disrupt or dismantle while we still need to take care of people who are being harmed? I'm trying to hold those two realities. And I, and I don't know if I'm doing a good job of that. Mary, I've got a lot of ideas for you. Okay, that's great. I'd love to talk to you offline. Nick, what were you gonna say? I was going to actually going to begin, you know, reintroduce the socialization concept. You know, uh, you know, everybody can, uh, you know, assume that they are the leader, um, but and everybody can follow a leader, but uh, to to really get things going, you know, you have to do so much uh, work in any community around people's self-image, people's and self-image, and and and. There's much to address there to enable Spoon's concept of the independence that 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 he feels um, because he's worked through his socialization. Uh, whereas, you know, I see somebody on the street right now, but it hasn't. Um, and I don't know. The, the complications are so enormous. Uh, at, for all of us at this moment, then the time is is increasingly uh, more pressing. Uh, so uh, I think you know as we as we move on, uh, if we keep those two thoughts close to our head, the time is pressing. Complications are enormous. Uh, you know, as as Tom uh, finds himself in the legislature. Um, the limitation of resources uh, is is 
another component of uh, enormous obstacle. But as long as we just keep playing with this game, when, you know, when the shit hits the fan in a way that all of us have to get together to literally survive for two weeks, well, maybe we'll be a step ahead. Well, if you get in touch, uh, uh, Nick, we don't have to keep playing the game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if you if you if you have the will to serve like Tom does, and Mary does, you know, it's um, the whole policy thing, and you touched on it on Nick uh, resources. It's it's kind of interesting how you you, you, you see a policy and you think uh, this is a good policy. Um, uh, no, it's a bad policy, or it's good or bad, or whatever. And I'm for it, or I'm against it. But how it changes your mind when somebody says, "Hey, we got the money." Your your whole idea changes uh, when you hear those words. It's kind of interesting, and I'm I, I'm sure it's true of every member. And and that you know, I mean, to kind of like get back to something, uh, just to think a beat for a second uh, that it, what happened in the depression, what, what, what FDR was able to put together. Um, and of course, World War II, you know, launched at, 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 at full speed is this enormous expense of the federal government for the improvement of society uh, along the way of also creating a, uh, a, a new infrastructure at, and a, a new code of labor and a whole series of, of, of serious structural reforms. Uh, it, that is what in, in our best lights, we would love to see the current resident in the White House be able to lead uh, through and, and if our if our esteemed senator had been there, we know he would have been chomping a little bit more uh, ferociously. But you know, facing the Senate and facing the obstacles and all of that stuff, the dysfunctional uh, gridlock that is paid for by Charles Koch and his ilk uh, create this enormous obstruction. If, if we can't get rid of Charles Kilt, Koch, uh, Koch and his ilk and those obstructions to gridlock, uh, before, you know, the, the deluge, well, we're in trouble. And, and, and so when, you know, the money, where's the money? I, you know, uh, what was that? Well, anyway, yeah, like that. Well, here's another perspective. Uh, I'm a member of our local uh, government here, the uh, representative town meeting, and we're doing a little bit of political work in there recently. And someone said, uh, geez, I wish we could have a little money to buy some books. And the other person, and then uh, someone else said, well, we should ask the town manager. And then someone said, well, we should really ask the select board. Well, we probably should this year because we've already passed the budget. But next year we can just allocate some money for ourselves at our representative town meeting because all of the town's money is the people's money. It is not the select boards. It is not the town managers. It is not state governments. It is our money. That's why town meetings approve a budget because it is their money and they choose how to spend it. If they dare. Final so, thoughts. So anybody? Anybody? Sorry, sorry, Nick. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I mean, we're coming close to the uh, eight thirty mark here, and I, I've enjoyed this. Um, anybody have any final comments? Well, I've enjoyed it too. It's uh, it's a it's uh, it's a really an illuminating discussion. Um, the question comes up: How can we have a, a bigger audience? 
<laughs> That's the big question for me. Um, How about a uh, question like, do we have democracy in Brattleboro? More people would be interested in that, in that maybe in Brattleboro. Well, I think uh, Tim also suggested a, an idea based on uh, something that you said, Mary. I'm not sure. My memory is not that great, but do, do you recall what that was? Something that we could we could investigate fruitfully on a forum like this? Any recollection? No, I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow night. All right. Well, I, I might have put something in just some, in, when Tim sent out the first announcement, Woody, I was, I'm in the throes over here in New Hampshire. Um, just even as of today, talking with a group of teachers who are signing on to the Zinn Education Project, which is, there's a national petition out right now of, of, of teachers who are resisting the legislation around opposing critical race theory and all of this other bullshit. Mm. And so um, I think I had put something in there about, again, thinking about how that's coming down the pike in Vermont. It's gonna start so starting in Essex and it's gonna make its way down. And yeah. what some of the folks, I'm just gonna say with some of the folks we got going on in Wyndham County, in our school boards, in our select boards, we're gonna be having that same conversation that we're having over here in New Hampshire. So. I've already gotten emails, Mary. Exactly, exactly. So anyway, Woody, I think that might've been what it was, but it was, it was more kind of a drilling down to something specific. And I know these are super helpful for me because always Nick and Tim, when you all share out, you give me a lot of history and a larger, broader framework from which to work from. Thank you. I wonder if, um, if there might be interest in, in hearing about um, how other countries have dealt with authoritarianism um, and how, what have been the, the ways in which they've dealt with, you know, return to democracy or, or democratization in the context of author, authoritarian rule. There's a lot of people around here, I would gather who, you know, would have that kind of experience perhaps to, to speak about that. It'd be very interesting. Maybe we can invite some Cubans. I think we did, did we just, I mean, I, I love that idea, Teresa. And it feels like, didn't we have that as one of our topics, to Nick or Tim in the last six months? I thought you did something on authoritarian, or maybe just- Well, yes, we have, we have done on uh, authoritarianism, but you know, trying to explain it or how it, how it comes about, how it evolves, yeah. and what it looks like in the United States. Yeah, um, but I guess I guess my idea would be um, a, a return to democracy or democratization in the context of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, for instance, Argentina in the uh, '80s. Yeah, and the bureaucratic uh, getting out of uh, their dirty war, <clears throat> primarily, honestly, through the mothers in the Plaza de Mayo started, but uh, but then the you know the military bankrupted itself with its invasion of Maldinas. So it really the, the return to democracy in Argentina was a perfect example of what Spoon said, but it, that uh, it, it only happened when everything came to nothing, when there were no food in the shelves and, uh, and the military no longer had moral authority to even look a soldier in the eye. Um, so there's a certain, uh, failure that has to, you know, that, that, that is a, and it, it's a real uh, conundrum uh, how autocracy, as it's called, is spreading like wildfire across the globe. And uh, I don't know of any success stories at beating it back re recently. I mean, I, I honestly don't. Bolivia? Bolivia? Oh, maybe. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Bolivia came close. They never got really going with it, but no, they were coming, right. they were virgin. They, they, yeah, they're always teetering, but yeah, yeah. Maybe Brazil next year, if we're lucky. Yeah, yeah. 
but again, that's only if through a, you know the death yeah, of complete collapse. Yeah, yeah complete collapse. <laughs> I'm going to say good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, Mary. I'm going to take off. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to take off myself. Yeah, it's a good and, time. Uh, thank Alrighty. you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Yes, sure. thank you. Yeah. Adios. Adios. Andres y mujeres. All right. One through the books. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Yes. See you tomorrow. Yeah. In closing, I have a few uh, announcements. Um, one to uh, first is to, to Mary Gannon for helping me figure out how to turn up the volume on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to everybody who came to the meeting. And uh, Thanks to WBEW and BCTV. Tell your friends that they can watch the video on BCTV and you can catch the audio on WBEW on Sunday the 11th at 5 p.m. So that's it for tonight for the Brattleboro Democracy Forum. We'll see you at our next meeting, we hope. And uh, that'll be on Tuesday, August 3rd. Thank you so much. Ciao, ciao. Good night.